So this third lecture will deal with gas transport in the blood and actually cardiovascular adjustments. And then with this, we complete the picture about uh, the basic systems related or important in the regulation of oxygen in altitude physiology. Gas transport in the blood basically implies that during acclimatization at high altitude, there is an increase in red blood cell number, an increase in hemoglobin concentration. This is the result of an erythropoietic response triggered by the release of erythropoietin, a cytokine. Erythropoietin will target the red blood, the, 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 the bone marrow to produce new red blood cells that will be released into the circulation. The final, uh, mess, uh, the, fi the final conclusion here is that if at sea level you have a given hemoglobin concentration uh, that actually accounts for a co oxygen content around 19 milliliters of oxygen per 100 milliliters, when you go at altitude because the partial pressure is lower, there is going to be less saturation of the blood compensate for that, you can increase the hemoglobin concentration. Increasing the hemoglobin concentration makes it possible that the oxygen content, the capacity for transporting oxygen is maintained. So th that, that would be the first message. But this is, notice an acclimatization response. This is something you can see also in this graph by looking at the oxygen dissociation curve. The oxygen dissociation curve shows you how the partial pressure of oxygen is related with the content of oxygen. And as you go down in this curve, you move from the arterial side to the venous side of the circulation, and then the amount of oxygen that is downloaded represents the oxygen that is transported into tissues and that is used by the tissues. This amount of oxygen, the difference between the arterial and the venous oxygen concentration, multiplied by the blood flow, gives you the oxygen uptake, gives you the oxygen consumption. So, in an acclimatization situation to altitude, you have erythropoiesis, increased uh, hemoglobin concentrations. In an acclimatization situation. Uh, a little bit of the same, this is from the same uh, study uh, from the Codwell Extreme Everest Expedition, and measurements taken at different heights, this is the measurements done back in London and then in the different camps. And what you see is what you would expect, that the partial pressure of arterial oxygen actually goes down with altitude. That the oxygen saturation goes down with altitude as well. The higher you go, the less saturated the blood is. In normal conditions, at sea level, blood should be 98 to 99% saturated, fully saturated. The hemoglobin concentration increases, increases as a result of the erythropoietic response that I just mentioned. There is an increase here, and eventually later it's maintained. Of course, this has nothing to do with the altitude. It's simply that the subjects, as they keep climbing, they are acclimating, and they, they, it's, it's possible to see basically how the increase in hemoglobin is taking place. And finally, as the hemoglobin concentration increases, you expect the content of oxygen in the arteries also increases in association with the hemoglobin. Notice that by the end, because of the dramatic change in saturation, there is a fall in the oxygen content. At this point, the saturation is so much lower that not even with a given amount of hemoglobin, with this hemoglobin concentration, you can support the same content. The process of erythropoiesis is well illustrated in these uh, schemes here. And this comes from an earlier expedition to, to Everest in which you have the altitude profile. Here you have the first step, basically C is uh, basically home, K stands for Kathmandu, Lhasa, and as you basically go into base camp, the different days there. And what you see here is the typical profile for climbers climbing Everest, we doing these acclimation climbs and coming down back to the base camp basically finally for the summit attempt. What do you see in this middle graph is the PCV, that's the same that the hematocrit, the packed corpuscular volume, 
is basically increasing as a result of erythropoiesis from 42% would be a regular normal uh, sea level value up to 54%. This actually shows the erythropoiesis. Down here, you see the culprit. Who is responsible for this erythropoiesis? Erythropoietin. Erythropoietin is this cytokine that is released in altitude as a result of the tissue hypoxia, and tissue hypoxia causes high values or uh, high, high levels of erythropoietin that are going to be stimulating this production of red blood cells. Erythropoietin increases two hours after hypoxic exposure. So as, as these climbers are getting into altitudes, uh, erythropoietin levels already increase. But notice, there is a big delay between the release of erythropoietin and the production of red blood cells. This is a process that takes time in the bone marrow, so it's not an immediate process. It takes about two to three weeks for this response to accumulate, and it can actually take longer before it, it is maximized. Together with the changes in red blood cell content, you have changes in the organic phosphate 2,3-DPG. 2,3-DPG is an organic phosphate that changes the affinity of the hemoglobin for oxygen. Mm -hmm. During acclimation, acclimatization to altitude, we see an increase in the concentrations of 2,3-DPG. And notice what is the effect of increasing 2,3-DPG on the affinity of the hemoglobin for oxygen. The affinity, the, uh, actually, the partial, uh, the, the P50 for the hemoglobin for oxygen increases, which means that the affinity decreases. Increase in P50, decrease in affinity. So when the concentration of 2D3DPG increases during acclimatization, there is actually a decrease in affinity for the hemoglobin. The bottom line is that you have a shift from the oxygen dissociation curve, the normal oxygen dissociation curve, into an oxygen dissociation curve with a reduced affinity. This is happening at altitude, but is it any good? At sea level, a, redu a reduction in affinity favors improves unloading of oxygen in the tissues. That you see here. If at the tissue level you have a partial pressure of oxygen of 40, with the reduction in affinity, instead of being here, Instead of saturated 70 or 80, uh, 75%, you are saturated 65%. That means that the decrease in saturation is more oxygen delivered to the tissues. Originally, when people realized that in acclimatized subjects to altitude, you had an increase 2,3 dpg and a reduction in affinity, they thought that this was the same thing. In altitude, in altitude you have an improved unloading. Unfortunately, they were forgetting something very important. That as you re reduce affinity, as you, uh, as you increase, increase unloading, you are, also increasing, you are also decreasing loading. Because at the partial pressures at altitude, it could be down here or even lower, there is also a difference from here to here. So nowadays, the change in 2,3 dpg that actually reduces oxygen affinity does not seem to have any, at least we don't know at today, what would be the beneficial effect. The, apparently, there is no beneficial effect whatsoever in the increase in 2,3-DPG. That's something that you will find in your uh, textbook. It's well explained there. As I said, no benefit at altitude with the, two, the, the redu reduction in affinity. What happens with the cardiovascular adjustments to altitude? First of all, you have an increase in cardiac output, but this increase is acute. In the long term, at cardiac output returns to normal values. So what's happening is that immediately after the exposure to altitude, cardiac output is trying to compensate, but later on, it returns back to normal. Heart rates are, however, higher than at sea level. There is a higher heart rate. That means that there is a lower stroke volume because cardiac output is not. So the main cardiovascular change that appears at altitude is, again, the existence of pulmonary hypertension. Pulmonary hypertension that actually can involve hypertrophy of the right ventricle. Subjects that are exposed to high altitude for a relatively long period of time start remodeling the heart, the right ventricle. 
the ventricle that actually pumps into the um, lungs. Because of the increased pressure, the heart muscle has to work harder, and it becomes thicker as well. Mm -hmm. Hypertrophy of the right ventricle. Pulmonary hypertension associated with altitude, of course, is due to the increased pulmonary resistance. That's what we covered in the previous lecture on hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction. Mm -hmm. And now, the other thing that people are, are interested in and that have been working extensively at altitude is what happens with maximal oxygen consumption. Maximal oxygen consumption has the ability to increase oxygen uptake in these conditions. Maximal oxygen consumption, you have tested it yourselves, is basically done, is basically achieved by increasing the power on a static bike or any other means and then measuring oxygen consumption as it climbs. When the levels settle down, that's what is understood, that is your aerobic oxygen uptake limit or VO2 max. What happens at altitude with VO2 max? This is what happens. Basically, as the inspired partial pressure of oxygen decreases from 150 sea level down to the top of Everest, the oxygen consumption, the maximal oxygen consumption drops. And one could predict that at a given height, basically, maximal cardiac out, maximal oxygen consumption reaches the basal oxygen uptake. Baseline oxygen uptake is the, the oxygen needed to support body function in normal conditions. Essentially, if you reach this level, you should not be able to move. You should not be able to be able to, to do any activity. So as the partial pressure of oxygen gets lower with altitude, your capability to extract and transport oxygen to the tissues keeps decreasing until the point that basically it could not be distinguished from baseline levels. Mm -hmm. Measurements done basically suggest that to be the case. Notice that in this case, what you have in this scale now is the maximal rate of oxygen consumption compared with the percentage of sea level. At, on top of Everest, you are on the edge of 20 to 25% of your capability at sea level. So at high altitude, on top of Everest, you drop your capability as much as down to 20-25%. In other words, if you are more fit at sea level, you should be able to make it better at high altitude. Of course, that's not a surprise. Finally, a summary of the response to altitude. And this is part of this acclimatization response to altitude taking into consideration what's happening. Mm -hmm. You see basically here a time scale, and what you see is that heart rate changes initially and then it lowers down. This happens very quickly, followed by the hyperventilatory response, hyperventilatory response to su support uh, the, the arterial, the, the oxygen, the partial pressure of oxygen high. The ventilatory response associated with CO2, this is the concept with the carbon dioxide ventilatory response and lowering of bicarbonate. The increase in hemoglobin, notice that it comes later. It takes about two weeks for a, a hemoglobin concentration to increase, increasing carrying capacity. There is an increase in capillary density. The amount of capillaries in muscles increases as well to decrease the diffusion distance, facilitate downloading of oxygen. And this is where basically the acclimatization response finishes at around two to three months. After that, we start talking about adaptation. We start talking about the, po the possibility for making long-term responses, long-term uh, changes that actually facilitate, help you cope with altitude chronically in the form of hypoxic ventilatory response, in the form of reduction of the hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction. Remember what we just said. Hypoxic or pulmonary vasoconstriction is one of the most powerful hinders. It's causing high altitude pulmonary edema. In chronic conditions, if you could eliminate this, if you could eliminate this response, you would actually facilitate acclimation, adaptation to altitude much more. And we will see in the next lecture that that's actually the case. It's been shown for some animal species. Thank you very much.